Our scripture this morning comes from both the Old and New Testaments, the first from 1 Kings chapter 19, beginning at the fourth verse. Hear the word of God. But Elijah himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. And he asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly, an angel touched him and said to him, get up and eat. He looked and there at his head was a cake baked, a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank and then he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. At that place, he came to a cave and spent the night there. And then the word of the Lord came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? And then from the Gospel of Mark, the first chapter. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts and the angels waited on him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. By your grace and through your mercy, we pray, O Lord, that you will allow these words to come to point to the word just read and to the word made flesh in Jesus the Christ, where we pray this in his name. Amen. William Broyles, Jr. is a Hollywood screenwriter. He has been involved in the writing of such movies as Apollo 13, Planet of the Apes, The Polar Express, and Saving Private Ryan. One of the other films to his credit is the movie Castaway. Some of you may recall the movie Castaway. It starred Tom Hanks as a man, Chuck Nolan, who survives a plane crash in the ocean and ends up on a deserted island, stranded there for four years to survive on his own with whatever he could eke out of that island. When Bill Broyles was preparing to write the screenplay for the movie, he decided to create his own castaway experience and found a remote beach out in the Gulf of California and spent a week mostly by himself trying to experience what it meant to be alone and survive. And while he was doing this, lo and behold, a volleyball came floating onto the beach. And Broyles grabbed it and held onto it and after a while began to relate to it and for even a moment talking to it. This was, of course, the birth of Wilson, the volleyball. If you've seen the film, you remember that Chuck Nolan recovers a volleyball and after a while begins to relate to it. It's drifted off onto the shore, a Wilson volleyball. At one point, he bloodies his hand in anger. He grabs the volleyball and throws it and leaves a bloody imprint that looks like a face. And so after a while, he begins to treat the volleyball as this imaginary friend and calls him Wilson. He talks to it and sometimes even thinks that Wilson is communicating back to him. It's a clever part of the story, and on one hand, a brilliant means by which to show how deeply relational every human being is, that no man is an island. We desperately crave relationship, even if we have to make it up. But on the other hand, the movie suggests that something that Chuck Nolan didn't bring to that island, which was any sense of the experience of the presence of God. Losing his home, his family, losing his contact with the world, Chuck Nolan found himself truly alone, not having taken with him any understanding of the reality and presence of God. 
In the story, there is no prayer of lament. There is no prayer of petition, no prayer of gratitude for having survived, no prayer at all because there is no God, no presence of God to which to relate. We will be blessed, will we not, if we do not have to live through four years on a deserted island or four weeks for that matter or four days. It's likely that you and I will never be tested to such extremes, stripped of all we hold dear and left to ourselves. But to wonder about such an experience is to wonder about our experience of God. In what way and to what degree do we believe that God today shows up in our lives? What expectation might we have that God would appear as we face into the struggles and trials of life? How real and present is God in your days and in mine? In our stories this morning, from the Old and New Testaments, we read of the great prophet Elijah and the Messiah Jesus, who for different reasons find themselves at the end of their ropes. Elijah has just stood up against the powers that be, the the false prophets of the fertility god Baal and the corrupt king and queen Ahab and Jezebel, and now he's on the run. Elijah has done what he thought God wanted him to do, but no good deed goes unpunished, and now he's a fugitive running for his life. But you can only run so far, and finally he falls exhausted with no hope of going further. That's story number one. Story number two, Jesus, after being baptized by John and having the Spirit descend upon him and the voice of God claiming him as his beloved son, we are told by Mark that the Spirit drives him into the wilderness, cast away into the wilderness where there are no fast food restaurants or motel sixes. Forty days he's there, and 40 days in the wilderness can take you to the end of your rope. It can make you vulnerable to the devil. A hungry man might sell his soul, give his kingdom for some bread and water. A famished human might start talking to volleyballs. In both Elijah's story and Jesus' story, what we're told is that at the end of their ropes, angels came to visit. Elijah wakes from his unconscious state and sees beside him an angel cooking the prophet some lunch, hot cakes simmering on a stove of hot stones and a pitcher of cool water. And like a good Italian mother, the angel says, eat, eat, your skin and bones, boy, eat. And Elijah gets up and eats, and it's enough for the 40-day journey ahead of him. In the other story, Mark, in his usual style, gives a scant description of Jesus' wilderness experience, 40 days alone with the devil tempting and the wild beasts threatening. But then, then, angels come. Angels come and wait upon him. In his weakened, threatened state, Jesus senses the presence of the heavenly host upholding him, feeding him, and giving him strength against the wiles of the evil one. And soon he returns to civilization and begins preaching about the kingdom of heaven. Now, in both of these stories, we are given no description of the angels. Neither writer explains what they looked like. No halos, no wings, no flowing gowns. All all they say is that there was an angel or there were angels, but no composite sketch. And that goes for most angels in the Bible. In fact, the Bible is not particularly interested in describing what angels look like. Seldom do we get a description, and that may be for all sorts of reasons, and it makes me wonder if it doesn't leave open for you and me the possibility that angels can show up in all sorts of ways. Angels may be visiting more than we know. In fact, I wonder if in all those moments when someone does something within our view that gives us some renewed hope, some reason to go on, some belief that maybe there is some, still some good in the world, if maybe we can claim those as visits from the divine. 
If in fact, wherever there is good, there is God. If in fact, wherever there is love, there is God. If in fact, wherever there is healing and hope, there is God, then why would we not accept the possibility that these visitations of goodness and love and healing are not visits from angels? I wonder if one of the reasons why we don't think this way is that we are so inundated with the bad news of all the godless events that seem to be happening around us. You can't turn on your computer or your TV and not have someone tell you how the world's going to hell in a handbasket. And if you spend all your time watching the world go to hell or waiting for the sky to fall, then you don't have much time to look for angels. Just a few days ago, when the good Kansas City Chief fans came out to celebrate their Super Bowl champion Chiefs, I think the game was fixed. (laughs) Into the crowd came shooters who took the life of one and wounded many others. And when I read that headline, I just shook my head and lamented over how this seems now just to be the way of the world, another shooting, more innocent people dead. And then a day later, I'm reading about this father running down one of the gunmen and tackling him and bringing him to justice. And I wonder, was that an angel? A couple weeks ago, I stopped at Starbucks And while there, I used the bathroom, and while in the bathroom, did not notice that my phone was slipping out of my pocket. And so 20 minutes later, when I was 15 miles down the expressway, I realized I did not have my trusty electronic friend. My first feeling was fear that someone had walked off with it, which happened to me once before. So when I returned to the coffee shop and inquired, and the woman at the counter smiled and handed the phone back to me, saying how much she liked the wallpaper picture of my grandson, (laughs) and that a man had turned it in, no name, no face, no description. My daughter said, isn't things like that that restore your hope in humanity? True, I said, and maybe they make us believe again in goodness. And where there is goodness, there is God. And where there is God, maybe there are angels. 36 years ago, when my mother was dying an early death, my father and brothers and I were there in the ICU unit surrounding her bed, disbelieving that this woman who brought us into the world and loved us unconditionally and was our champion was slipping from our grasp. Four Presbyterian ministers, we, all alone there at her bed with hearts breaking. It was the middle of the night. We were in a new town, new to all of us, so no family and friends upon which to call. Four pastors who were used to being the visitors now so badly in need of a visit. And then a man walks in the door of the room, a pastor from town. How did he know to come? We never got the answer. But there he stood with us, saying all the things that should be said, and thank God not saying the things that shouldn't be said, holding our hands while we held hers, and praying and giving her over to God. A skeptic might say that there is likely an explanation as to why and how that gentle, caring man appeared, but I don't think that means he wasn't an angel. Angels appear in ways we sometimes understand and often don't understand. I went to visit years ago a woman who was in a psychiatric hospital, an older woman who had struggled with depression on and off throughout her life. She was in a bad way. We talked for a while, but it seemed that whatever I had to say really didn't amount to much. My presence, it appeared, was of no encouragement. 
And then I remembered a sermon that I had heard years and years before preached by an old New England preacher on Isaiah chapter 40. So I found a Bible and turned to Isaiah 40 and read to her those amazing words of the prophet. Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and grow weary and the young will fall exhausted, but those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Remembering what the old New England preacher had said about these verses, I plagiarized him and said to the despairing woman, isn't it interesting what Isaiah says, that for some the strength of the Lord allows them to mount up with wings like eagles. And for others, the strength of the Lord allows them to run and not be weary. And for others, perhaps the most courageous of all, the strength of the Lord allows them simply to walk, to take one step after the other without fainting. And then I added, our greatest experience of the presence of God can sometimes be in getting the help to take just one step at a time. And that was the word, by God's grace, the transforming word for Carolyn. And every time she witnessed somebody helping her take one step, just one step, she knew she had been visited by an angel. Which makes me think of the story that came out of Mount Sinai Hospital in New York just a couple years ago. A woman named Cheryl Reed Lewis was recovering from surgery and in a great deal of pain when a hospital housekeeper, a man named Miguel, gently knocked on the door and asked if he could come in and help and tidy up. And as he did, he gently inquired about her condition and learned that she was in a great amount of distress. So he quick got a nurse who came and helped her. Later, when he was back, he caught Cheryl cleaning up the floor after a mess she had made, and he insisted on taking care of it and sent her back to bed to rest. Well, each visit and each day was filled with these kind words of encouragement from Miguel. The caring and encouragement and compassion melted some hard things in Cheryl to the point where she began to say to herself, I want to be like Miguel. A few months later, after her full recovery, she applied and was accepted to be a hospital housekeeper, just like Miguel. Every day, she said, every day I do my job, I say to myself, what would Miguel do? Garrison Keillor wrote once, in a time of elephantine vanity and greed, one never has to look far to see the campfires of gentle people. Lacking any other purpose in life, it would be good enough to live for their sake. Get up. Get up and eat, said the angel. Otherwise, the journey will be too great for you. The journeys we take in this world are difficult, and the circumstances of the world don't make them any easier. No good deed goes unpunished. And we can grow doubtful and discouraged. We can easily think the world is going to the dogs and as a result, see dogs snapping everywhere. And that the devil will have his way and the journey is too great. We can get to the end of our ropes with no strength to hold on. But every day, every moment, good and gentle people quietly traverse the streets and corridors of our harsh world doing good things, caring for strangers, helping people take one step at a time. People like you, people like me. Angels are about doing what the Savior has sent them to do. Hark, hark, wrote the hymnist, hark. Pay attention, angels are singing.